Like any emerging technology, the history of the electric car has brought us a number of firsts over the years. Nissan showed us with the leaf that electric motoring didn't need to be weird, tiny or useless. It could just be a normal hatchback that does family car stuff with little complaint. Tesla showed us that cross-country travel didn't need to be a chore. Chargers in abundance that just worked when you plugged them in. GridServe showed us this experience could be open to everyone. The birth of the electric forecourt moves charging away from the forgotten device in the corner of a stinking petrol station into a purpose-built facility that you actually want to spend some time in. It's time for another first. A car that makes you question why you'd bother buying anything else. All of the upside of electric motoring at a price point that makes you wonder how other manufacturers can justify their asking prices. What else could it be but the MG4, of course. There's no denying that the styling is striking, especially in the brighter colours like the orange that this test car comes in. It's a little awkward from certain angles, but catch it just right and it certainly looks futuristic. It will not be for everyone, I'm sure, but remember, even if you hate the styling, you can't see it from the driver's seat. So you join me in the very orange MG4, and in, inside, it, things are a little bit more muted, but the in, it, immediate first impression is that MG really have leveled up here. If I compare this to the ZS EV that I owned, it, it is, it's in a completely different league. We, we seem to have yards into the roundabout. entered a, a completely new era of MG interior, and it's really nice in here. Any shortcomings of the exterior are forgotten about as soon as you step inside. It looks amazing, and it gives anything else in anywhere near the same ballpark a run for its money. MG have seriously upped their interior game when you compare it to some of their older models. I would say the, the materials don't feel like super premium, but it's definitely a step up from where we were before. And I'm even going to entrust the, the built-in sat-nav. Take the second exit to A131. Which is quite verbose in its instructions, but... Uh, so today we are driving from the grid server electric forecourt in Braintree to the grid server electric forecourt in Norwich. So it's a decent chance to see what this thing is capable of. And I'm going to trust the built-in sat-nav to get us there because it seemed immediately seems much more responsive, much more with it than the one in the ZS. This particular car is the top of the range MG4 Trophy long range with a big battery. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily the one that everybody will buy. Uh, I think the, the real value lies in the SE, the base model SE. In 600 yards, enter the roundabout and take the second exit to A131. Which comes in at that 26995 price point. I think that is where this car really does change the game. There are three MG4 models currently available in the UK. SE, SE Long Range and Trophy Long Range. The SE base model that takes that headline grabbing price point of 26995 has a 51 kilowatt hour battery making for a WLTP range of 218 miles. The SE Long Range at 29495 has a 64 kilowatt hour battery and a WLTP range of 281 miles whilst the Trophy Long Range, the car I'm testing in this video, has the same battery and a slightly lower WLTP range of 270 miles. That will cost you 32495 White or blue are your free paint colours, black or grey are 545 red and orange are £695 and orange is only available on the range topping trophy model that we're testing here. As far as driving impressions of this thing, it's got power on tap, it's got all the poke you absolutely need. A uh, little bit of wind noise, a little bit of road noise, but no more so than I'd expect at this price point. In fact, it probably, you know, outperforms what you'd expect at this price point. But I'd say it was probably on par with the, the Mark 1 ZS in that front. I don't think there's been a, much of an improvement in, in that sort of bit of refinement, I think. But uh, it, it certainly seems very capable. Um, Performance-wise, as I say, it's got all the performance you want. But let's see how it performs on this journey. It's quite, it's quite an interesting test. So the last time we did the test drives at Grid Server was just sort of round the block in each car um, on, on a bit of a... 
head to the roundabout and take the second exit. On a bit of a tight schedule trying to fit it all in, we were just taking one one car at a time, quickly out round the block, you know, and sort of initial impressions. Whereas this should give us a lot better idea of what the MG4 is actually like. This car was very kindly lent to me by GridServe using their test drive service. As you may have seen in my previous videos where I drove a Leaf, a Tesla Model Y and a Polestar 2, whether you're looking to buy or lease a specific EV, have a, a number of them in mind or are just trying to work out whether EVs are for you and you'd like to give one a go for the first time, why not go along to one of the GridServe electric forecourts and take some test drive? They're 100% brand agnostic and you aren't going to get the hard sell from them. They're going to be more than happy to arrange a lease deal for you if you like, through their leasing arm, obviously, but there's absolutely no obligation. And in my opinion, from what I've seen of them, they are genuinely interested in helping people begin their EV journey, whatever that looks like for them. The test drive fleet is always growing, and the booking process is dead easy with loads of availability at both the sites in Braintree and in Norwich. And they plan to roll this out at every electric forecourt site as they open more. Give it a go! There's a link in the description to the section on their website where you can browse the available cars and book a test drive today. Well, I think it's quite funny, although there's a, a little bit of trim on here that says MG Electric underneath the parking brake button. I'll put a photo of it on here. It, it looks just a little bit like the uh, the Polestar sort of decals you get on the Polestar 2. We'll put them side by side. And yeah, I definitely think there's been a little bit of inspiration there, which is quite funny. That's the sort of um, blind spot side impact type sensor thing was beeping at me thinking there was a car next to me just then and there very much is not and that can often be the problem with some of these driver aid things uh, they can be a little bit overzealous but I don't think the hedge at the side of the road is going to jump out at me I wish I could show you the display it keeps showing me that so it shows me there's a car in front but it keeps showing that there's possibly one to the side as well it does show my, my absolute hatred for some of these driver assistance systems. And uh, in true MG fashion, this one is absolutely packed with that. We've got speed sign recognition, we've got the adaptive cruise, we've got all the safety features that, that you get in a package with that. We've got the lane keep assist, all that stuff. It's all here, absolutely in droves, as you would expect. Now, whether or not you like that and want to make full use of that, definitely up to you. Uh, you know my hatred for lane assist. We talk about this in great length in the past. In true MG fashion, there's an awful lot of equipment as standard, even on that base model SE. A 10 and a quarter inch touchscreen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, app connectivity with the MG iSmart app, and the MG Pilot suite of driver aids provides pretty much everything you're likely to be looking for, even in that base model. The trophy adds sat-nav, although as you'll see later in this video, you'd maybe be better giving that a miss. Heat your front seats, heat your steering wheel, a 360 degree parking camera, wireless phone charging and more. So you're definitely going to see a difference for the extra money should you choose to plump for the top of the range model. I like that we've still got some physical buttons on the dash below the touchscreen. So some of the key functions like taking it back to the home screen and some of the, some of the climate control operations like demisting the windscreen and uh, turning on the rear demister. That's all there. Now what we don't have again is the temperature control. So. It seems that I'm, I'm assuming to adjust the temperature in here, I need to scroll through the menu. And I, I just don't know why manufacturers do it. We've got some buttons and I do welcome that. I think it's good that we've got some stuff controlled by actual switches. Like there's volume buttons here and stuff, that's great. But the climate control is probably one of the things that you want to adjust most often. And yet there isn't a physical control for that. So yeah, that's not so good. Nice big touchscreen though, of course, quite like that. I mean, it's not, not we're not talking like Tesla size. Um, you know, a fair, a fair bit smaller than that, but it's nice. Nice and bright as well, looks good. I think the overwhelming thing with this one is just is that orange paint that's everywhere I can see. Just just, just that little bit of such a striking colour. I think it's absolutely fantastic. We need more cars in actual colours, less monochrome. Seems to ride reasonably well. Suspension is firm, but not too firm. I mean, it's not like bone breaking. Um, you know, you, you can feel the bumps in the road, but it's certainly not like, you know, you need a new back afterwards. Like, well, like an Ami. Um, it's definitely nothing like that. I think it, it's fairly, fairly competent in terms of ride. I'm hoping that um, the traffic thins out a little bit. We can maybe uh, see a bit more about what the handling's like, but I'm not sure. We'll see, see what the 
if this traffic thins out a little bit, we might be able to actually put it to the test properly. Otherwise, it's going to be just a, sitting on a single carriageway road doing like you know 45, 50 mile an hour in traffic. But we'll see. But I do just think with this car, we, we really are entering the, the the sort of era where if you're looking for a brand new car, now I, I understand they're, they're still expensive, right? Twenty-seven thousand pounds is still a lot of money. But if you're looking for a new car, that amount of money doesn't buy you that much in this sort of the, the brand new sort of petrol diesel car market or plug-in hybrids or whatever. So let's actually take a quick look at what else you could buy for the same kind of money brand new. I don't think it's fair to say, well, oh, you know, you can buy something that's four years old for, for a lot less money. That, that's not what we're talking about here. If, you, if you're either buying a brand new car or you're getting on a company car scheme or you're leasing it or whatever you're doing, people that are buying brand new cars in are going to have a yard, enter the roundabout and take the first exit. Are going to have a more and more difficult choice to 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 justify not choosing an electric car when you've got something as capable as this at this kind of price point. So it, it'd be really interesting to we'll, we'll have a quick look across the market and see what else you can buy brand new for the same kind of money. If you let the budget creep just very slightly to twenty-seven and a half thousand pounds, you'll get yourself into a Renault Zoe. A little bit smaller, definitely showing its age these days, the model's been around for a little while. Slower charging, but it's definitely a capable EV. The Fiat 500 electric also creeps into play at that £27,500, but it's no competition for the MG4 really, is it? Due to its size. And that really is about it for brand new EVs, demonstrating the huge value proposition that the MG4 really is versus other electric cars. What about petrol or diesel cars though? Well, as you can imagine, there's plenty of choice at this price point, but I'm not sure it's like clear cut that you definitely want to choose any of them over this if you're open minded enough to be considering going electric in the first place. A petrol MG ZS costs more than £20,000 these days, which is absolutely staggering given they were selling the Mark 1 ZS EV for that just a couple of years ago. Pretty much every manufacturer offers something with, well, a completely uninspiring 1 litre or 1 1.2 litre turbo petrol engine in this kind of ballpark. £27,500 for a Ford Focus or Ford Cougar, £27,499 for a Peugeot 308, a cancelled order lowly spec Golf if you're lucky, but the list price at £34,95 suggests those will be few and far between. It's deeply uninspiring stuff really, but it really does hammer home how much MG have absolutely nailed the price point here. Obviously, if you're hell-bent on never having an EV, it's not going to matter to you even if MG start giving them away, but for an awful lot of people, it's sure to be a head-turner for that value proposition alone. The sat -nav seems to be doing the business. I'd say it gives an awful lot of verbal instructions. Um, you know, it prompts you a lot more often than some do. I, it's all right. Uh, but it seems to be performing and it seems to be do getting me to where I'm going, so that's good. Uh, the the one in the, the Mark 1 ZS was not good at all, so I'm definitely a bit more impressed with this one. <laughs> one thing I've noticed, and the, the ZS did this too, so this is a dual carriageway, it's a national speed limit dual carriageway. So the speed limit for a car like this is 70 miles an hour, and we are doing 68 to 70 miles an hour, and the, the speed limit sign is flashing at me, which you, it will do if you're speeding, if it thinks you're speeding. So. The reason for that is because it thinks the national speed limit sign means 60 miles an hour, which obviously on a single carriageway it does. Uh, and the, the ZS did that as well, so it's, uh, it's a little bit of quirk in the software. I'm guessing it, it knows that it's a national speed limit road, but it doesn't know that it's a dual carriageway and therefore it's not recognising that it's actually 70 miles an hour speed limit. So it's an interesting little quirk that the, the ZS used to do that as well, and I, I do wonder uh, I've not driven many cars with traffic sign recognition, so let me know in the comments. Uh, have you seen that before on other cars, or, or do they perhaps use the mapping data from the sat nav or whatever to know that it's actually a dual carriageway you're on? I'd be really interested to hear that, because I haven't uh, had this feature in any other car I've driven, so I don't know. But I, I did notice that the ZS used to do that too, so it tells you you're speeding, even though the speed limit's actually higher than it thinks it is, which. It's quite interesting. I mean, I, I, I know you, you obviously there's the traffic sign recognition and stuff. It's, it's meant to be an aid rather than a sort of, you know, be all and end all. You're not meant to take it as gospel. But I, it's, it is definitely a, a sort of quirk in the software that um, I think could be better. Don't try to change lanes without indicating because the lane keep assist will tell you off as well. 
Oh, that's interesting. So I've just noticed that I'm praising this at lab and saying how great it is, but the display seems to have frozen. Now, I don't know if it was me messing around with the climate that's done it, but the, the voice controls, the voice instructions are still going, but it's stuck. So it isn't telling me on the screen where I'm going, but it's still giving me the voice instructions. That is strange. I think I've managed to cancel the navigation now, which is good. Guidance will start now. Proceed eight miles on A14. Yeah, that was weird. So they did some kind of stall. So maybe the software isn't quite as good as I'm saying it is. And that, for me, it was 100% where MG come unstuck when I had the ZS, was, was the quality of the software. But not that they're the only manufacturer that has software issues. I mean, you know, some of the early the stories of people with the Volkswagen ID3 and stuff, pretty shocking. So. Uh, it's not just, oh, it's just it's MG, they're Chinese, they can't do software. That's very much not what I'm seeing here. But I would expect, I wouldn't expect the Santa to crash just because I adjusted the temperature. That's a bit odd. And of course, just like with the ZS, it supports Apple CarPlay and all that stuff. So for most people, you, you could probably avoid using the built-in Santa altogether. I mean, it is back to doing its job. Uh, I don't know if it just had a funny moment, but... If you, you could avoid it altogether by just using CarPlay, which might be the way forward. And problems with this sort of manufacturer built in infotainment and sound lab and stuff, they're definitely not unique to cars at this end of the market. You know, there's all sorts of stuff out there from some of from premium manufacturers that should know better that can be a bit rough around the edges and a bit rubbish. So I think it can't mark MG down too much. For, for the fact that Santa have froze once, you know. I don't think that's a reason not to buy one. You rejoin me about 15 miles from Norwich. I just had to stop for a quick battery change of the camera. Uh, it seems the, uh, the batteries for this 360 camera can't quite go the distance. But, uh, so we're, we've covered about so 60, five, yeah, 65 miles. Uh, it's now showing an average of 3.6 miles per kilowatt hour, which I think is quite respectable, given I've not really been hanging around. And it's not, like, super warm today. Maybe about 10 degrees or something. Oh, 9 degrees. Uh, there is a readout on the display. 9 degrees. It's not, like, super warm, so I think it's doing pretty well. And I must say, I, I am really enjoying this. It is just a really competent, decent car. I think if you could overlook the badge and any, you know, preconceptions you might have of, of MG... I, you definitely need to give one of these a go. If you're looking for an electric car and, and, and it's in your budget, or you're maybe even looking at something a little bit more expensive, you need to take one of these for a test drive, I think, because it just, it does everything you can ask of it. Battery level now is 67%, down from, there was like 91, 92 when we left. Um, we've covered like 65 miles, it's just 139 miles of range remaining. So I would say the initial readout, which is about 190 when we left Braintree, fairly accurate. It seems like it's um, it's very much in touch with reality, which is good. You know, sometimes the guess on what or an EV can jump around a lot and make you feel a bit uneasy. But with this one, I would say it's pretty spot on. And it's certainly looking like when we get to Norwich, if we want to, we could just turn, turn around and go straight back to Braintree without even having to think about charging, which is awesome. And there, of course, we have Grid Serve's Norwich Electric Forecourt, which means my time with the MG4 today is coming to an end. All in all, I would say it's very impressive stuff. And I'd reiterate the point that I think a lot of manufacturers have got a lot of competition on their hands now. Um, unless they can get themselves anywhere near this price point, I don't know why you wouldn't buy one of these. It is fantastic. Very, very impressive. Slight, still a little bit glitchy on the software front. I'd say that the the sat nav, at least, um, yeah, still not quite there for me. Um, I, I I am a little bit disappointed because although they have they've smartened it up a bit and it's a lot more performant and stuff, a lot better than it was. Still a bit buggy. 
Still a bit more you can do, MG, but maybe that's the price you pay at this price point. I'm not sure. Absolutely everything else about it. The interior quality, the fit and finish, the performance, the range, the, the efficiency. So uh, we've done 80 miles now. It's 3.7 miles per kilowatt hour. I think that's fair enough. Uh, we've got 62% battery remaining for a predicted range of 132 miles. So I think on, from a range point of view, it's performing very well. So all in all, I think MG have absolutely cracked it. And I think if, if you're not considering one of these alongside whatever other EV you're considering, especially if it's sort of within about, you know, 10, 15,000 pound of this, I think you're doing something wrong. The MG4 is a seriously impressive car that completely redefines entry level EVs for me. It's well spec'd, it has enough range, it significantly improved interior quality over previous MGs, and it is a ground up EV that has been designed to be electric if you care about that kind of thing. It's got fast charging, it's not terrible looking, although the styling might not be for everyone, and it's certainly striking in that orange or Holborn blue. You'd be mad to rule it out, no matter what you're thinking about buying, I think. It's well worth a test drive, and I would definitely recommend that you do that at one of Grid Serra's electric forecourts. As always, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments. I'm sure there's more than a few of you that are seriously considering the MG4, so I do hope that this video has been helpful for you. Don't stress too much about missing out on the sat-nav if you're only going to have the SE model. You really aren't missing much. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you're new here, and I'll see you next time.